So now let's begin with the appendicular skeleton, starting with the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle is the shoulder girdle. It's the attachment site for the arms. It consists of just two bones on each side of the body, the clavicle, or the collarbone, and the scapula, which is commonly known as the shoulder blade. The clavicle is going to articulate medially to the sternum and laterally to the scapula. We'll have on one end the sternoclavicular joint and on the other end the acromioclavicular joint. This picture illustrates that nicely. Here's the clavicle and this is the sternoclavicular joint where the clavicle meets with the manubrium in the clavicular notch and then the end that articulates with the shoulder blade articulates with the acromion as a shoulder blade, which we'll learn when we look at the shoulder blade. So we have a sternal end and an acromial end. The scapula will also articulate with the humerus. The joint there is called the glenohumeral joint. That's the shoulder joint. It's a ball and socket joint. And it lo dislocates pretty easily due to its loose attachment. So the humerus would articulate here, right in this socket. And as you can see, there's not much there of the socket to hold the ball of the humerus or the upper arm in place. Here's a closer look at the clavicle. The sternal end and the acromial end. We'll see towards the acromial end a coronoid tubercle. The sternal end also has a rounded head. And the acromial end has a flattened head, so you can tell the two apart that way. The clavicle functions to brace the shoulder and keep the upper limb away from the midline of the body. It's the most frequently fractured bone in the body. The scapula is named for its resemblance of a shovel or spade. It's a triangular plate that overlies ribs two to seven. It has three sides and three angles. We have the medial border that's towards the middle of the back here. We have the lateral border on the lateral side and the superior border is the top side of it. The three angles are the inferior angle that you see right here at the bottom of the shoulder blade. The superior angle that we see right here on the medial corner of the triangle. And the lateral angle we see here where the upper arm articulates with the shoulder blade. We'll also notice a spine, a transverse ridge on the posterior surface. You can see that here. Above the spine is a supraspinous fossa. Below the spine is an infraspinous fossa. Remember, fossa is a large, flat area. And then when we flip the scapula over and look at the anterior view, we have the subscapular fossa. So you've got three sides, three angles, and three fossas on your scapula. The lateral angle of the scapula has these three main features, the acromion, the coracoid process, and the glenoid cavity. Let's look at those. So this is the region we're talking about, the lateral angle. We have an acromion and a coronoid process. The acromion comes over the top of the shoulder joint and holds everything in place. It articulates with the clavicle and is the sole point of the attachment of the scapula and the upper limb to the rest of the skeleton. The coronoid process is shaped like a little hook and it acts as the attachment site for tendons of the biceps and other arm muscles. Finally, there's the glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity is this slippery surface here. It's covered with cartilage and this is the socket of the ball and socket joint of the shoulder joint. As you can see, it's pretty shallow and there's not a lot to hold the humerus, the head of the humerus or the upper arm in this space. 
you've probably heard of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is a series of muscles that go from the upper arm and attach to various points around this joint. Those are the primary forces that hold the upper arm in place. So together, the clavicle and the scapula form the pectoral girdle. So pause here, close your books and notes, and draw yourself a simple scapula. Note the three borders and the three angles, the acromion process, the coracoid process, the glenoid cavity, the spine, and the three different fossas. On the clavicle, remember to be able to identify the sternal end, the acromial end, the coronoid tubercle. Now let's move on to the bones of the upper limb. The upper limb is divided into four regions. It contains a total of 30 different bones in each limb. The brachium is the upper arm, or the arm proper. It extends from the shoulder to the elbow, and it contains only one bone, so that's pretty simple. It's the humerus. It has a lot of features, though. The antebrachium is the forearm. It extends from the wrist to the elbow. It contains two bones, the radius and the ulnar, and all of their features. The carpus is the wrist. It contains eight small bones that are arranged in two different rows. And the manus is the hand. There are 19 bones in two different groups. There are five metacarpals, which are the palm of your hand, and 14 phalanges, which form the fingers. Let's look at the brachium the upper arm. It's composed of the humerus. The proximal end is where we'll see the head. This head is also covered in cartilage and it articulates with the glenoid cavity in the scapula. The anatomical neck is the neck that's right between the head and the greater and lesser tubercles. However, the surgical neck will see is this narrower neck below the tubercles. We'll see on here one distinct feature in the shaft, the deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid tuberosity is where the muscles of the deltoid group attach. Those go over the shoulder. And you can feel the deltoid tuberosity when you get your hands on Hank. It's really important to touch these bones and feel the features because they are fairly prominent. There are greater and lesser tubercles. The greater tubercle is a larger bump and the lesser tubercle is a smaller bump. In between those tubercles is the intertubercular sulcus or ditch. So here we're starting to use a lot of that terminology that we introduced earlier. Let's move down to the distal end of the humerus. At the distal end, we'll see a rounded capitulum. The capitulum will be articulating with the head of the radius. The other bump is called the trochlea. Now, I'm not sure why they have to use such complicated names here. Later, we'll see that they're simply called condyles. But above each of these features, above the capitulum, we'll see the lateral epicondyle. Epi means above, so it's the bump that's above the condyle that's called the capitulum. And the medial epicondyle, which is above the trochlea. So the trochlea is on the medial side of the elbow. And the trochlea and capitulum are simply the slippery surfaces that are going to articulate with the bones of the forearm. The capitulum, again, will be articulating with the radius and the trochlea with the ulnar. The radius in anatomical position, then, will be on the lateral side. Thus, we have the lateral epicondyle. And the ulnar will be on the medial side and we'll have the medial epicondyle. We'll also see these ridges that lead up to the shaft of the bone. There are the medial 
supracondylar ridges and the lateral supracondylar ridges. The olecranon fossa is the ditch in which the funny bone sits. It holds the olecranon process of the ulnar. You can really see this articulation well when you get your hands on Hank. The coronoid fossa is a ditch in the other side of the humerus joint, and the radial fossa is right next to it. So go ahead, right now, pull out your paper while we're on this slide. Write down all the features that you need to know about the humerus. There are many more, but we're not going to learn all of them. Okay, so how's that outline going? So far, you should have everything outlined for the axial skeleton. And now we're beginning to build our outlines for the appendicular skeleton. You've got the scapula, you've got, you've got the clavicle, now we have the humerus. Let's move into the forearm, the antebrachium, where we'll look at the radius and the ulnar. These two bones here interact with the trochlea and capitulum of the humerus, and they form the forearm. The radius is on the lateral side. Radius rotates around the ulnar. So if you were to have your hand in anatomical position and then turn your thumbs inwards, the radius is going to rotate. You can feel it. Go ahead. The radius will rotate around the ulnar. So the radius is always on the thumb side. The radius has a head, which is the disc-shaped portion. This allows for the rotation I was just speaking of. The superior surface of it, the slippery surface of the head of the radius, articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. There's a side of the disc also that's going to spin in the radial notch right here. So both of those surfaces are covered with cartilage. We can see the neck here of the radius, right above the radial tuberosity. The radial tuberosity is another attachment site for the biceps muscle. As we move down to the other end of the radius, we'll see the styloid process. You can feel the styloid process as the bump right near the base of your thumb. We'll also see an ulnar notch right in the side of the radius at this distal end. That's where the ulnar will sit and articulate with the radius at this distal end. Now let's take a look at the ulnar. The ulnar is the bone that's located when our hands are in anatomical position that's located on the medial side of the arm. It has a few big features. Let's look at the proximal end first. We have the trochlear notch, which will articulate with the trochlea that we saw on the humerus. The olecranon is this bony process that sticks out beyond the back of the elbow. It's the attachment site for our triceps muscles. Animals that dig a lot have a huge olecranon process because it forms a lever to create a lot of power in the forearms. We'll see at the distal end of the trochlear notch, a little coronoid process. We'll also see a radial notch in which the radius spins. And again, at the distal end, forming the wrist bumps, the styloid process. You can palpate the styloid process in your wrist also. So here we're looking at the anterior view, and here we're looking at a posterior view. So in anatomical position, if we were looking from behind you, you can see the olecranon process clearly, as well as both styloid processes of the wrists. Between these two bones is an intraosseous membrane. This holds them together and allows 
the rotation of the radius. It also allows the elbow joints to share the load that you might be lifting with your hands. So again, stop. Add to your outline. You've got two more bones to add and each of their features. Remember, you're only held responsible for the terms in bold on each of these slides. These are the same terms that are in bold in the text of your textbook. The figures may show more detail in structures, but you're only responsible for the bold face terms from our lecture and our text. Now let's look into the wrist. There are eight different bones that form the wrist. They allow the movements of flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction in the wrist. There are two rows, each having four bones. The proximal row as shown here in yellow. If we move in anatomical position from the thumb side across, we can name these bones. The proximal row contains the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrium, and the pisiform. The distal row from the thumb side across contains the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. You can almost palpate these bones in your wrist, but not quite. Now, there's a mnemonic for remembering these. The mnemonic goes like this, starting in the proximal row from thumb side to pinky side, and then the distal row, thumb side to pinky side. It goes, some lovers try positions that they can't handle, right? So scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. That should help you remember all of those. Otherwise, they're kind of tough. Now we look into the metacarpals and phalanges. The metacarpals form, form the palms of the hand. These are these five bones that are just distal to the bones of the wrist. We label them number one through five. Number one is on the thumb side, and number five is proximal to the base of the pinky finger. They just have three regions that we'll look at, the base, the body, and the head. The phalanges are the bones of the fingers. There are 14 of them in total. The thumb, or pollux, as it's called in Latin, has two phalanges, only two phalanges. It has a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. The fingers, however, have three phalanges each. The fingers are named, numbered number two, three, four, and five. The second finger, for example, has a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, and a distal phalanx. So we might call this proximal phalanx two, to be specific. So now we have all the bones and features of the pectoral girdle. Add the additional features to your outlines, make it complete, and then we can move on to the pelvic girdle and the legs. Oh, and don't forget to look at each of these bones and their features in Anatomy and Physiology Revealed. I know the list is getting long, but remember, you have this skeleton with you at all times, 24 hours a day, so you can always study these bones and their features. In every spare moment you have, just think about a particular bone and see if you can name all the different features on it. It really works.